in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Hello Story Seekers, I'm Nico. I'm Ben, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. There were simply too many good stories to fit into just one roundup, so you're getting two. A tremendous amount of meat on the bone. Kicking us off for part two, we have the inimitable Kit Power, a horror writer who has the skills for short and long fiction. Kit wrote to the prompt, The Hardest Break. The Hardest Break. There are 206 bones in the human body. Over half of them are contained in your hands and feet. 27 each hand, 26 each foot. That's something to think about, isn't it? The entire skeleton, the frame for all that lovely meat we inhabit, and there, at the extremities, so many small bones, interlocked by cartilage and tendon and muscles, Granting us balance, allowing motion, instrument manipulation. Oh, please, don't struggle. The bonds are quite secure, I assure you. As I was saying, over half the bones in the hands and feet. Rather dismayingly easy to break when you look into it. A little too fragile, in my opinion. Rather one in the eye for intelligent design. Hands and feet. Not merely so useful, but so necessary, and yet... Well, you read of someone breaking a toe by simply stubbing it on a door frame, don't you? As for fingers, all it takes is a moderate hammer blow and... Goodness, you are excitable, aren't you? How amusing. Why don't you take your own advice? You know, relax and give it your best shot. That's what you told me, wasn't it? So then, good for the goose and all that? Besides, nothing hard about a broken hand, is there? Such a fascinating question you ask, though. Such a clever question. No doubt it's designed to elicit certain personality responses. I imagine you've got a chart somewhere allowing you to plot someone based on their response. No, no, please, don't try and answer. Rather a futile gesture. I thought about it, you know. On my way home, I had time to think. One does when it's a 45-minute walk to one's house and one cannot afford the bus fare, let alone the cab. Lots of time to cogitate, to ruminate. Yes, all right, even fulminate. And I realised I didn't actually know the answer. So I looked it up. You're going to want to pay attention to this. You see, interestingly, it rather depends on what you mean by hardest. Example, the smallest bone in your body is the stapes. It's a tiny splinter that sits in your ear and together with two other similarly small bones is responsible for transmitting the vibrations of sound to your brain. Now, one of those could be snapped between two fingers, providing it was first removed. To fracture that bone in situ, though, that's actually surprisingly tricky. Perhaps a very loud noise might do it, or a gigantic concussive blow to the ear... No? Oh, very well, I think I agree. Besides, how would we know for sure we'd succeeded? A hearing loss could as well be a burst eardrum. Moving on. There's the petrous part of the temporal bone. This bone is incredibly dense, designed, or rather evolved, of course, as you may have gathered from the name, to protect the temporal lobe of your brain and the ear canals, housing that rather delightful tiny stapes we discussed earlier. Even in skeletons that are dug up after thousands of years, it's not unusual to find the temporal bones entirely intact, even in otherwise damaged or desecrated remains. So I think we have a contender, yes? Of course, bone that dense, the blow would have to be colossal, and the chances of brain damage, even fatality, would be considerable. Still, something to think about, isn't it? On the other hand... On my walk home, my rather long, damp walk home, I found my mind turning more and more on the precise phrase, hardest. Hardest to achieve? Hardest to survive? Or perhaps 
hardest to endure. Yes, I thought that might pique your interest. You'll recall, of course, that was the spin I brought to the question, much to my detriment. And so as I walked through the rain, as the drizzle became a downpour that ensured that my one remaining half-decent suit was quite ruined by the time I made it back to my flat, I pondered that and added it to my research list. And here's what I found. Coming in at number four, the clavicle, known more colloquially as the collarbone, this bone, here. Yes. Apparently even a hairline fracture is very painful, and anything more serious can often require surgery. It's amazing how powerful and fragile we are, isn't it? Moving on at number three, we have ribs, beloved target of pulp crime and horror writers, and it, it's obvious when you think about it. Your ribs move with every single breath you take, so naturally, a broken rib is uniquely debilitating. Victims report a sensation of burning, stabbing pain every time they try and inhale. Our most natural, instinctive movement becomes a source of acute discomfort and misery. Nasty. And of course, should the injury be serious enough, there's the possibility of a splinter of bone piercing one of the many vital organs the cage exists to protect, at which point... Well, so... Number two, and this one surprised me, though it makes sense when you think about it, is the tailbone. I suspect the implications are clear enough that I can just let them sit with you. <laughs> oh dear. Dear me, I am sorry. Un unintentional, I assure you. And so we reach number one, and by happy coincidence, it's also the strongest bone in the body, the femur, or thigh bone. A combination of the thickness of the bone, the surrounding muscle mass, and the necessity of the bone for walking all conspire to make it, without question, the hardest break in both senses of the word. <laughs> Remarkable, isn't it? Might almost make one believe in some kind of destiny. I think this sledgehammer may do the job. I'll try and get this done in one, but honestly, I've never done anything remotely like this before, so please do bear with me, and perhaps... If the pain doesn't entirely blot out all higher brain function, we might take the opportunity to reflect on whether it's really appropriate to ask someone interviewing for a job waiting tables in a chain restaurant about their hardest break, and, for that matter, whether, should you decide to ask the question anyway, laughter is an appropriate response to someone discussing the loss of their father. I am, of course, fully aware that it's a difficult economy, but... In a final analysis, we are all still human beings, and a little human dignity shouldn't be too much to ask, should it? All right, then. Here we go. Wish me luck. Our next reading came from performer and storyteller Tom Kirkbride. His YouTube channel consists of found spooky tales. This particular found tale comes from Reddit user Requiem for Nocturne, and gave us the prompt, A Cold Wind. When I was a kid, I lived in a small town, and like most small towns, there were stories. I could vaguely describe some of them, and no doubt you'd recognize many of them from your own towns. Most of the time, these stories were told, and many people, myself included, blew them off as flights of fancy, conspiracy theory, or the result of a paranoid mind. Until you see them for yourself. In my town, there was a legend that came to be something parents told their children to get them to behave. This was the legend of the Rain Man. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Oh no, not another Slender Man story. <laughs> I really wish I could say the same thing after what I saw that night. I was around nine or ten at the time. My family, mom and grandmother, lived in a rented house in a community of older people. There were very few children my age around, so a lot of the time I would go out and explore my surroundings alone. Unlike a great deal of stories that I've read in the past, I didn't live in a place where there was a huge forest behind my house and things came out of it. No, I lived in what was essentially the middle of town. Each house was no more than 30 feet from one another. However, the street I lived on did have a large power station at the end and behind that was a huge field that led to our town's flood wall on the banks of a pretty good-sized river where the train trestle spanned it. It was in this area I saw it. 
I remember that night vividly. I had set a trap over by the trestle hoping to catch myself a rabbit. What I was going to do with one when I caught it, I hadn't thought that far ahead. It was early September around Labor Day because I had a three-day weekend from school at that point, so I could stay out much later than I normally would otherwise. It was just getting dark when I made my trek through that big field and up to the top of the flood wall. I was not in that great of a shape, so I had stopped to catch my breath. I was bent over, my hands on my knees, and I was taking deep breaths when the wind blew. It was a cold wind that really did not match the surrounding temperature, but it wasn't the temperature that caught my attention, though. It was the light sound of what, even now, I can only describe as crystal wind chimes. I stood up and held my breath, straining my ears to hear it again, but for long moments I couldn't hear anything. Nothing at all. It seemed like everything had fallen mute, lending the deepening darkness an eerie quality. I should have gotten the hell out of there right then and there, but I was an adventurous kid and I was gonna get a rabbit. Self-preservation was not a high priority to me at the time. Despite the ominous feeling that was screaming at me to run away, I pressed on, taking careful steps down the far side of the flood wall to the small paved path that curved around under the trestle. There were thick trees to my left blocking my view of the river and lending the little path an almost claustrophobic feel in the dark. As soon as I stepped onto the path, another wind blew again, carrying with it the soft tinkle of the crystal chimes. Again I stopped and stood there, straining my ears to hear that sound again, but again there was nothing at all. I remember thinking to myself, what the actual hell? I stuffed my hands in my pockets and took a few more steps down the path. I was moving slower now my sense of danger making my steps rather hesitant. But onward I pushed. I came around the curve in the path where the trees opened up, and I could see the river illuminated by the rising moon. But the river wasn't all I saw that night. There, standing directly under the trestle in the middle of the river, on top of the water, was... Uh, Thinking back on it now, what I saw there, even I find it hard to believe. It seemed to be vaguely human-shaped, yet inhumanly tall. It wore, or its body was made up of, from my vantage point, what looked like gray, dirty rags. Its arms were spread out to its side, seemingly feeling the air with fingers that looked more like bone-white claws. However, it was its head that caught my breath in my throat. The head was surrounded by what looked like flowing clouds rolling slightly in a wind that touched nothing but the thing in front of me. And through those clouds, its face. My God, its face I will never forget. It was emotionless, like that of a mannequin, and as sickly white as the belly of a fish. It had no eyes, only black holes that seemed to be staring not at me, but through me. It was then I involuntarily gasped and its head snapped, really seeing me now. Again, the sound of the tinkling crystal, so much louder this time, rang out. I was paralyzed. I wanted to run. I wanted to hide. I wanted to be anywhere but right there, right then. But I was stuck. The thing then started to move towards me. Not so much walking on the water's surface as gliding above it, as the water below was not disturbed. It was at about thirty paces from me when I began to hear it. A childlike voice that seemed to be all around me, saying over and over again, Rain, rain, go away. Come again another day. Its claw-like hand reached out towards me once more. Rain, rain, 
go away, come again another day. As it reached in my direction, my paralyzation ceased and I didn't waste any time. I turned and ran as hard as I have ever ran in my life, yet still the incantation Rain, rain, go away, come again another day. Chased me up the path, over the flood wall, and into the field. I could feel that thing chasing me, whether it was or not. I don't know. I didn't dare look behind me. I just ran all the way home, slamming the door behind me. For a long time after that, years, I was afraid to leave my house alone, and I always slept with my lights on. Even now, 30 years since that day, my heart starts to pound, and I almost have a panic attack when I hear, Rain, rain, go away, come again another day. Because I know that the Rain Man will indeed come again. Mer Lafferty joined us next. Mer is a Hugo Award-winning author and podcaster who wrote to the prompt, Underground. Underground. When Grandma's house on Earth had gotten Wi-Fi installed, it killed the last of the fairies. Or so she said. She had a lot of opinions on the dead fairies, and now she lived on a dead planet. Definitely no fairies here. I asked her once if fairies needed oxygen to live. She waved me off. If Mars had had fairies, they could live underground, she proclaimed. The brownies and gremlins would love it here. It had minimal underground lines, unlike Earth. Fairies could easily avoid them. If they stumbled across a connection, it would be no more than you or I would feel with a static shock. Back home in Ireland, fiber optic lines and the fair folk couldn't mix. My dad's gift of Wi-Fi had enraged her. She complained for a week, let me tell you. She said when cable TV and internet and the high-speed internet and the cell signals and then Wi-Fi came along, it became a tightening spider web of danger for the fair folk. Many retreated. To more and more remote areas, she said. Even a charming small town being too much of a danger. A friend of mine from school once asked, I didn't think people believed in fairies anymore. But my grandma did. The problem on Mars, of many, was that they needed humans for the strength of belief, for someone to simply mess with. Without humans, fairies got bored. I lived with Grandma to get her settled on Mars. I frowned at her shiny new laptop with far more computing power than she would ever need. What's your password, Grandma? I asked, trying to unlock it. I'm not supposed to say, she shouted from the kitchen where she was watching a cooking show on the screen of her refrigerator, which had a constant stream of cooking shows from Earth. Grandma, you can tell me. We're related, I protested. Fine, it's my birthday. I rolled my eyes. Grandma, that's highly insecure. You mean you forgot my birthday? She yelled. It has to be something I remember. I'm too old for that memory implant your generation has, she said. I'll put down something you remember, I said. After I got our Wi-Fi connected and hooked up the laptop, connected her phone and all the other smart devices, I went to admin and changed her password. No fairies on Mars! Exclamation point. Goddamn bread didn't rise, Grandma shouted. What I would give for some fairies. How disappointing, her fridge soothed. Would you like a glass of milk? The small amount of tryptophan will have a calming effect. Mary, when will this thing learn how to offer me bourbon and not milk? She asked, coming into the room. And I thought these things were supposed to make humidity perfect for baking. Sometimes the error is in the user, Grandma, I said, and dodged the dish towel she threw at me. I got you all hooked up. Here's your password. Memorize it. Remember, anywhere there's a zero, there's an O, you should write a zero. When there's an A, you should use a four. Then you're just writing half a sentence that's easy to remember, but it's secure. That's a funny phrase, she said, looking at the words, no fairies on Mars. Did you know my grandmother also believed in fairies? Of course I know that. The story was why I was living with her. Not the whole reason. I wasn't a monster who was just sitting there using life support to care for grandma. I was there to help with the terraforming, too, and to help with her. But that meant I had to hear her stories. Of course I know that, she mocked. They kept me company when I was a child. They cared for me. I know, you've told me, I grumbled. I put the kettle on for tea. 
And then I went to her tiny linen closet. It was full of bolts of cloth, synthetics Grandma had invented, but sending her among the first terraformers of Mars. Just some old cloth. I took a napkin with frayed edges. The next day at work, I went to the hydroponics and snipped a piece of synthetic linen and wove it among the roots of each plant. No one saw me. I'm not sure what they would have said if they had. That night, Grandma had said the fairies had killed the Wi-Fi. The night after, the fridge began showing a television show from 1998. The night after that, we were on a generator. Grandma said nothing, just glared at me. I said something weak about the central power grid and how things take time and we might be in trouble and asphyxiate, and she just shook her head. She finally said, you did the linen, but the milk, did you put out the milk? Grandma had revolutionized textiles by mixing natural fibers with plastics just to get the right weight and texture and strength. Her first attempts as a chemist were made with her own linen in her house, some old fabric that came from dresses and tablecloths that she had inherited from her grandmother and possibly further back. Some of them she didn't even know how old they were. She kept these prototypes. My legacy, she had said. Mars Central was in a panic. People were sure we would all die of asphyxiation, while Grandma and I sat with our generator, and I heard more stories of the old days that her grandmother had told her. That night, I went out before lockdown and put small bowls of milk around the greenhouse, the power grid room, and the hall outside our room. People who worry about asphyxiation don't worry about cleaning up bowls of milk. The next day, things were fixed. Grandma's bread rose perfectly, and the season's first round of vegetables ripened. And I marveled at how no one would ever know what my grandmother had really done to terraform Mars. But I would have to figure out how to convince the scientists to put gifts out for the fairies on Mars. Returning for our spooktacular Halloween episode, Tonya Ransom, who is the host of the Nightlight podcast, brought a chilling tale from the prompt, which, funnily enough, was Halloween. Legend has it that when a drop of blood touches the surface of the lake, a monster devours it immediately. That's not true. That little bit of blood isn't enough to draw any attention. A drop is nothing more than a waste of precious energy. But a warm body? That will get swallowed whole almost immediately. No modern human has ever seen what ate their companions and lived to tell about it. But plenty of people have watched their friends tumble overboard and disappear into the abyss and many so-called friends have been the reason someone has met their end in the lake. Case in point. About a hundred years ago, a family of four set out in a rowboat for a pleasant picnic on the small island in the middle of the lake. The children, both young teens, fought as most siblings do. Name-calling, insults, insincere death wishes. The father's powerful baritone failed to control them. The mother's shrill screams did nothing more than act as a dinner bell. The fight escalated until it became physical, the younger boy attempting to push his older sister into the water. But she was quick. She grabbed hold of his shirt. They both lost their balance, and then lost their lives. A desperately needed meal to the starving. You see, the people native to the area had been massacred by these picnicking colonizers a decade before. Before their demise, they'd sacrificed a member of their tribe, usually a criminal of some sort, every equinox. This was sufficient to round off a diet of fish and the occasional bear that wandered too far into the water. But fish didn't provide enough sustenance. Before the sacrifices, fishermen regularly didn't return home. When the natives finally saw something curious and large in the water one day, they put two and two together and realized they could choose who they would lose to the lake. For centuries, all lived in harmony a meal each equinox, as well as the occasional treat when a member of the tribe made a horrible enough transgression. Good fortune was bestowed upon the tribe. Their crops and hunting ventures were always successful, no matter how neighboring clans fared. It was a highly successful symbiotic relationship. Then the colonizers came. They didn't believe the natives' nonsense about the great spirit in the lake. They didn't believe it existed, and they didn't believe it required regular meals. To them, the natives were savages with primitive beliefs. They were simple-minded and deserved the benevolence and religion the colonizers had come to bless them with. When the natives resisted, they were killed. In a single night, the tribe was gone. No one remembers them now, 
save what they called Lake Dweller. And no one remembers a day when something below the surface wasn't hunting for its next meal. No one remembers seeing a majestic creature swimming freely in the sun, without fear of being hunted. Not a soul knows of the years a starving creature suffered in the lake, hovering near death, eating every living thing in the water. No one knows why there are no fish in the lake anymore, only that there are none. Sometimes a foolish traveler refuses to believe there are no fish and attempts to prove their fishing prowess, only to have their boat mysteriously capsized, their bodies never found. But a few days ago, a man decided to camp on the bank of the lake. This, in and of itself, was not unusual. Lots of people do this every year and return home in one piece. But this man had heard the tales of mysterious disappearances in the lake, and read the stories of those who watched someone else succumb to the deaths, despite being reportedly strong swimmers. While no one had actually seen an unknown creature in at least a century, it was well known that something in the lake was at least opportunistic, if not outright sinister, and this man was set on finding out what that something was, with a camera crew in tow. And if anyone could find the monster in the lake, it would be this man. He was famous for documenting the existence of creatures long lost time, though most skeptics believed he faked his evidence. But he didn't realize how dangerous this mission was. He didn't realize his would-be prey was tired of the dark depths of the lake, longing to live near the surface and bask in the sun, to cultivate another mutually beneficial relationship. The native's lake dweller refused to hide any longer. A life in the dark scavenging for food instead of being worshipped was no life at all. And so when the man's boat cut its way across the lake, I swam alongside it and plucked the celebrity from his perch on the bow in full view of the camera. My existence will be televised, and I will either have more food than I can eat, or I will suffer the same fate as the natives. I am not a monster. I am a god. The next story was courtesy of fellow podcaster Connor Braden, whose Story of a Storyteller podcast is available anywhere you can find the tiny bookcase. Connor wrote to the prompt, A Persistent Itch. For the past ten years, I've made a 50-year-old donation to a different charity but not under my name. I've a terrible memory for names. No, seriously, <laughs> absolutely atrocious. I need to meet you at least seven times before I can remember your name. Now, you think I'm joking, but when I was in school, I often couldn't remember teachers' names until the seventh week of school at the most, where I'd have to steal a glance at their name on the classroom door. I recall a time when a teacher screamed at me for calling her Miss Room 13, because her door didn't have her name on it. Turns out she was a new teacher, and the secretary, whose name I didn't know because her door just said secretary's office, hadn't made this new teacher's door sign yet. When I tried to explain, the teacher rolled her eyes and just said, It's Miss Sweeney, you idiot. That's not a hard name to remember. She made me stand up and declare her name three times, one for each time she had taught me at this point in the school year. As I repeated her name the third time, the laughs and giggles from my classmates punctuated my stammering embarrassment. I didn't forget her after that. When I left school, I took up a job in my mother's tiny newsagent. My friends vanished to the horizons to different colleges, while I stayed behind to earn some money to eventually move and start a life somewhere. It turns out my difficulty with remembering people's names extended to the names of formulae and equations and much more. College was not for me. The shop was on the main street of the town. Although my memory for names is awful, my maths brain came to the fore here. Here, behind the counter, I was a pro. I'd been working at the shop since my folks bought it back when I was 12. And now, many years later, I was beyond comfortable with the high-pitched beeping of the buttons. I could play that till like Beethoven could a piano. The sun, easy. Zero nine zero papers mag subtotal. My fingers could fly. The sun, a twenty pack of Benson and Hedges, a chocolate bar, a bottle of water and a pen. Piece of cake. Zero nine zero paper mags, one zero two zero six, one two zero sweets, one seven zero drinks, zero five zero stat, subtotal fourteen fifty please, thanks very much, have a good day. But then, a new problem showed up. You see, when I was in school, I usually just worked Saturdays, the busy day in the town. The crowds would surge and ebb, would rise and fall. Some, but very few, regulars would pop in. 
The most were people I didn't have to remember. The ones who were regular were usually picking up papers that they always collected, so we wrote their name on them and it was set aside. I knew their names easily. But now I was out of school. I was working during the week. During the week, I had to remember names. People would come in and chat me. Well, young fella, and giving the mother a day off, are you? And more. But then they got to know my name, but I never knew theirs. There was no door with a name in it, no papers set aside. No name tags, no IDs, no hints, no clues. The only help I ever got was in between shifts, when someone else would be coming in to relieve me, or I'd be coming in to relieve someone else, and a regular happened to be there. I kept customers separated in my head by something else. It might be their typical clothing. There was Lady Bluecoat and Mr. Plaid Hat, for example. Or it might be based on what they bought. Horse and cart mag man and silk cut Pepsi. The only help was just when someone else was coming in and helping. Ah, right, Peggy, how are you doing? Tom, how's everything? Oh yeah, not a bad day, Betty, but it was lashing earlier. Then I'd write down the names. Lady Bluecoat was actually Peggy. Mr. Plaid Hat was Tom and the true identity of Silk Cup Pepsi was Betty. I liked that that one almost rhymed. But there was one man, whom I called Persistent Itch, that never showed up when there were other workers on. Only ever me. He was old. And I don't mean old in the way a 19-year-old thinks anyone over 25 is old. I mean he was as wrinkled as a prune. He usually came in early in the afternoon on Wednesdays, before the cattle mart opened. He ambled in after the smell had already come in from him. Anyways, he was always dressed in a suit that was looked like it was last washed sometime around the fall of the Berlin Wall and was constantly, and I mean constantly, scratching his head as he walked in. Joe, he'd utter, nodding at me. The first time he called me by my name I was confused. I don't recall him being in here before. How did he know my name? It was a small independent shop. It's not like I had a uniform or a name tag. So how? Well, says I, how's the man? How's the man was one of my go-to phrases when I couldn't remember customers' names. Ara, persistent itch, removed his felt cap and shook the rain from it. He scratched his head and replaced the hat. I smiled. You know yourself. He shuffled across the shop floor, small as it was, and browsed the drinks fridge. He always seemed to be looking for something new to drink, but never bought anything other than Lucasade. Rarely he would take down a can or a bottle of something, even more rarely he'd walk across to the counter with it. But when it came to buying something, he'd tut, shake his head and put it back, buying Lucasade instead. Today he stared lovingly at a bottle of Pepsi. It was a new design, but he reached for the Lucasade. I felt my shoulders droop a little. So how's tricks today, Joe? Uh, grand, really, I said. With other customers, I'd start playing my piano there and then, masterfully typing up the prices and getting ready to announce the total. But with Itch, I didn't. I knew what he was really here for. The weather's brutal, isn't it? Oh, aye. The conversation threatened to go the usual route. Did you watch the football, or the hurling, or occasionally rugby? I remembered an old film I loved as a young fella. Did you ever hear of it? Or even the occasional book recommendation. But today, on this odd and rainy day in June, it took a sudden turn. I saw on the news there that it's, um, uh, ra rainbow month. He gestured towards the tiny gay pride flag I had sticking up from the till. My mother, or my boss, as I should really think of her, whatever you wanted to call her, didn't know. She knew I was gay, I came out years earlier, but she didn't want me to have a window display for Pride, or wear a Pride-themed t-shirt or anything. So instead, I snuck in a tiny Pride flag and stuck it into the till, hoping for the best. Even if most of the regular customers came in, didn't know or understand it, I knew and I hoped that someone who would know what it was would see it and feel a bit of comfort. Pride month, I said. Yeah, that's right. I really didn't know which way this was going to go, so I just waited with bated breath. My defensive and polite side was ready, but so was the seething and bubbling rage that only an indignant, self-righteous young person could summon. What do you make of them, Joe? The rain continued. Hm? 
the, he gestured again, rainbow crowd. You mean the LGBT community? Yeah. Do I help myself? I think they deserve far more love and respect and admiration than they get. Okay, relax, Joe. That wasn't outing yourself, but it was definitely staking a claim. Grand, says Itch, and scratches behind his left ear. Aye. Grand. He slipped a fiver onto the counter and opened the Lucasade. Before I had my chance to give him the change, he was walking out the door into the rain. Uh, sorry, your, your, your change. Keep it. Give it to the rainbow crowd. From then on, Itch came less and less. I thought nothing of it at first. Maybe he was offended that I was, at least in his eyes, an ally. For the next year and a half, as I saved and saved so I could move somewhere a bit more youthful, a bit more free, Itch was just a little different. He smiled a bit more when it was just us, chatted a little more openly, and often would leave some extra change, telling me to give it to the rainbow crowd. I gathered up the change he gave, eventually letting it build up to 50 euro, and donated it. I wanted to donate it in his name, but ashamedly, I still didn't know it, so I decided to wait. I built it up some more, the money eagerly awaiting that I pluck up the courage to ask him his name. I was working late on a Saturday. It was November now, and the evenings were dark, really early. And one night, as I was readying the shop for closing at nine, Itch walked in. I could tell he was drunk. Very drunk. There was a pub right next door to the shop, so drunken old men stumbling into the shop wasn't a new occurrence. But Itch? On a Saturday? And drunk? This. This was new. Joe, uh, good man, you're closing up. I am indeed. You'd be wanting some company. Uh, uh, no, thanks, I'm grand. Should, should you should get on home. Ah, uh, there's nothing there for me, he said. Just the TV in a cold bed. I froze. This wasn't the normal back and forth for us. That's it. Just a cold bed. No one there. Fifty years ago tonight. What is? My mind rolled through the dates I remembered from school. I had a good mind for dates, just, just like with maths, really. He died. Who died? My, uh, rainbow man. He leaned against the drinks fridge as I tried to process what he said. He loved Lucasade. He took his Lucasade from the fridge and sighed. I never really liked it. Who liked Lucasade? Patrick. The man I always wished would... Well, he died. Tractor accident. His father and mine were great, you know. He walked to the counter, and I thought I saw him wipe his eyes. Anyway, I often wondered what it'd be like if he hadn't got killed. He was a... a beautiful man. Itch threw the fifty onto a counter and walked away. Give the change to the rainbow crowd, I finished. Itch stood in the doorway. He was my best friend, you know. I never saw Itch again. I didn't know if it was shame or something else that kept him away. A few years later, I heard he'd been found dead in his home. I didn't really understand why, but I cried when I found out. Mum finally told me his name, accidentally, by sending me his obituary. R.I.P. Joseph McMorrow, bachelor, farmed his family farm for many years, died peacefully in his sleep. I immediately opened my laptop and scrolled to the first charity I could find and donated under his name. Finally, we were joined by the Black Library Warhammer author, David Geimer, who wrote a brand spanking new story for the prompt, What the Dead Know. What the Dead Know? Never trust a priest. That wasn't so much a Thren family motto as it was a general principle. Not that Coban Thren, last of his line, had the luxury of principles these days, even general ones, which was how he came to find himself standing in a graveyard in the dead of night holding a shovel. He wondered if this was bottom. He looked down, fidgeted his boots in the earth. No, still a little way to go yet. We should say a few words, or something, said Cedric. He was a young man, 
much as Cobra still thought of himself most of the time, until he spent a few evenings in a row with someone like Cedric. He had strong, useful-looking hands, neatly scarred, almost as if by a ruler with the marks of a rod. He had been kicked out of the seminary, that much everyone knew, though no one knew why. His bowl-cut hair was overlong and unkempt, his face rough but otherwise forgettable, like something you'd see on the back of a hundred-year-old coin. Coupled with the black frock of the Minoran sect that never quite earned the right to wear, he was a bland, subtly threatening presence who could pass almost any door unremarked. Coburn hadn't quite made up his mind if being a failed priest made Cedric more trustworthy or less. Principles there, eh? you'd have them. You say your prayers when you put them in, he said, not when you dig them back up. Cedric gave that due consideration. Sounds about right, he said. Those years of seminary school weren't wasted on you, were they? What would you have said anyway? The third member of Coburn's band of miscreants asked. His name was Wrangle, and he was of a similar age to Coburn, but with a nervous disposition that made him both look older and sound considerably younger. His great-grandfather had served Coburn's great-grandfather, and despite the dramatic convergence of their relative standings, that still counted for something. The dead had a hold on the living, and didn't give it up as easily as the aforementioned living could squander, for example, their wealth and titles. Filial drag was everything it used to be, thank the gods, because as bad as it was to have sunk so low, would have been hell itself to have done it without Rengel there beside him to go just a little bit lower. Sorry, I suppose, Corbin guessed in response to the question. I doubt she'll mind now, said Cedric. She? He, Corbin said. Cedric raised an eyebrow. The antiquarian mother told me it was a woman. Didn't she mention that to you? Corbin grimaced and looked away. He wondered how much more the other man knew about this than he did. If it was more than to be in this place at this time and to bring a shovel, then it was more. But then Coburn had cultivated the habit of never asking. It had been a defence of sorts. He had been lied to too often, cheated too often. The fortunes of a family as old as his didn't just disappear overnight, not without a few white lies along the way to smooth their way out. But in the life he'd made for himself since, it had turned into something else. A calling card, an identity almost. He was Sir Coburn Dowsel Thren, and he asked no questions. Ignorance, he decided, was both the safest cause and the most profitable state of man. With a sigh, he let the shovel bite into the thin crust of earth covering the grave, no deeper than the shovel's weight and his own action could push it in. There was no headstone there yet, just a wooden upright inscribed with the name and symbol of the god Menon, collector of all things lost. He shivered, but then it was the middle of the night, Nothing ominous to read into that. I heard she was a witch, Wrangle hissed. Shit, Coburn breathed and pulled out the shovel. If there's one thing you should never say in a graveyard. Sorry, I, I just heard. If she was a witch, then she wouldn't have been buried, would she? Said Cedric, all reason. She'd have been bound in silver and dumped in the sea at midnight. He signed himself anyway, because even priests didn't trust priests. They knew better. Coburn hated to admit it now. But not knowing what they were expecting to pull out of this grave was starting to get in. Most likely, the antiquarian mother just needed a fresh body. It was the sort of thing everyone knew went on, but which the Minoran sect had to be seen to frown on. All that knowledge, all those secrets, taken by the dead to their graves to add to the clutter on Menon's never-ending shelves. It was sacrilege to go looking there, everyone knew, but that was how the cult held its power. They knew what no one else did what no one else could. They knew what everyone who mattered was trying to hide. Of course, it was also just as likely that the antiquarian mother had just marked a fine ring on the corpse's finger during the burial. Priests were still just people, after all. Get on with it, Cedric muttered, vapour coiling around his frilled collar. I don't want to be seen hanging around a graveyard at night. You think I do, said Coburn. I still have a few friends left, you know, and a shred of reputation in this town. Dig, then, said Cedric. Coburn held the shovel out to him. You dig. Cedric raised his hands. I've taken strict vows never to disturb Menon's collection. Don't give me that. You were never ordained and everyone knows it. Cedric shrugged and put his hands in his pockets. Not for the first time, Coburn found himself wondering what could have brought a supposedly pious man to a career breaking fingers, picking pockets and robbing graves for the clergy. He supposed he'd never know, even if he did think he'd ever ask. <laughs> give me the shovel, Rengel sighed taking the shovel off him and sticking it bitterly in the ground. Cedric made the sign of me on and looked quickly away. 
Coven flinched, half expecting to see Witchlight come streaming out of the broken soil. The sound of a shovel cutting into loosened topsoil was rather anticlimactic. Coburn looked at his one-time servant in surprise. Rangel had never knowingly volunteered for anything. It occurred to him that a person's life wasn't unlike their unmarked grave. He thought, feeling distinctly philosophical in his moment of relief, he never really knew what was going on underneath, or what someone else knew about it that he didn't. With a frown, Coburn snatched the shovel back. It was a general principle of his, never trust a priest. He'd do it himself. Crikey, what a bunch of talented individuals they all are. We were absolutely spoiled by all the people who came on this season. Definitely. And with that, it is time to look towards the exciting prospect of season four. Four will be starting next week, and we're overjoyed to be so far from shore in the deep waters of podcasting and story writing. As always, make sure you're subscribed to The Bookcase on your chosen podcast listening app or service. See you in season four. See you there. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For a Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For rich ginger tones on their scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Algemother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?